Hi and welcome. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at a few strange cases from around the world, I hope you like them. The first story takes a look at Dr. Schmidt, whose jealousy led him to a horrendous act. Janice Trahan Allen was a young married mother, who lived in Lafayette, in Louisiana. She had just graduated nursing school, and managed to gain employment at a local hospital. It was there, she would meet the handsome Richard J. Schmidt. Richard was also married with children. The pair worked together, and Richard soon became Janice's family doctor. It wasn't long before an affair started between the pair, which soon became serious, and they decided that they should leave their spouses and begin a new life together. Janice left her husband, she took her son and moved out of the family home, to the house her and Richard were going to live together. She waited for Richard to do the same, but the dirty doctor wouldn't leave his wife, Janice was heartbroken. Although Janice was in love with Richard, she did not intend to be a mistress all her life, so she tried to end the affair with him. Richard wasn't happy with this, and every time she tried to end the affair, he'd become enraged and vowed to ruin her life. He would go on to post naughty photos of Janice on the works notice board, and even threaten to kill her. By blackmailing Janice, he managed to keep the affair going for 10 years, but finally, in 1994, Janice ended the relationship. Although she ended the affair, Richard was still her family doctor, so after feeling lethargic for over a year, Richard advised her that she had a vitamin B deficiency, for which he would give her vitamin B injections. These injections went on for over a year, until one day her situation deteriorated, her lymph nodes were swollen, and she had severe pain in her eyes. Seeking a second opinion, Janice went to multiple doctors, but nobody could pinpoint what the problem was. She then went back and seen Richard, who took a sample of her blood and sent it away for testing. Janice was in for the shock of her life when the results came back. She had somehow contracted hepatitis C and was HIV positive. Janice was absolutely distraught, she thought her life was over. Richard immediately began spreading the news to all of his co-workers, telling people that Janice would go out to bars and take random men home to sleep with. He painted a picture of her, that she was a loose woman and had contracted HIV and hepatitis through her own doing. None of this was true of course, Janice was a respectable woman whose only affair was with Richard himself. Janice knew she wasn't sleeping around, and knew the only way she could have contracted these diseases, was through Richard. She went to the police, and told them of a night that Richard rang her, telling her he was coming over to give her a vitamin B injection. He arrived at her house within minutes, and gave her the injection, which she said was very painful, and then left. He was in and out, the whole process took under five minutes. But Richard was a well-respected doctor, nobody would believe Janice, and she had no proof. Not yet anyway. Just two months before that injection, Janice had donated blood, and the blood she donated was tested, it was clean, no sign of HIV or hepatitis, and she'd not had sex with anyone since then. Janice knew Richard was to blame, he had deliberately infected her. Police checked Richard's phone records, and it showed that Richard had made a call to Janice that night, just as Janice had said. Police then got a warrant and searched his surgery office, they looked for the patient records for the day in question, but they somehow were missing. After a full search, detectives found them in a file that was marked for 1982 patient records. They found two patients who had blood tests taken that day, and also found that Richard had never sent the blood off to be tested. When police tracked these two people down, one had hepatitis, and the other had full-blown AIDS. The AIDS patient told police that Richard telephoned him, insisting that he come in that day for a blood test, even though he didn't have an appointment. Detectives tested Janice's HIV strain against the AIDS patients, both were identical. Richard denied being to Janice's house that night, and told detective that he was with his wife all evening, and she could confirm that. When detectives spoke to Richard's wife Barbara, she confirmed he was there all night with her, although she took a 20-minute bath, around the time that Janice said Richard was there. That explains why Richard was in such a hurry that night, in and out within five minutes, just so he had an alibi. Richard's wife didn't even know he had left the house. 
HIV doesn't last long outside the body, that's why Richard was so anxious to inject her that very night. He made his lethal concoction, just because she ended the affair with him. Richard was charged and found guilty of attempted murder, and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. In 2015, he was denied parole, and he still maintains his innocence. Janice has sadly passed away, due to what this man inflicted upon her, he should be retried for murder. What a total idiot this man is. He's got to be the world's most sloppiest bank robber. Robert Williams stole $20,650 from a suburban Maryland bank, but he forgot to take a bag to put all of his stolen cash in, he then managed to drop all the money on his way out of the bank. He scooped the money up from the floor and put it in an open umbrella, not ideal for a quick getaway. He ran from the bank, with his upturned umbrella, and made his escape in his green minivan. Howard County Police were soon on his tail, and deployed tire spikes, which brought his vehicle to a stop. Williams then fled on foot, and after a brief chase, Williams slipped on a sheet of ice, nearly knocking himself unconscious, allowing the police to apprehend him. He was charged with robbery, and maybe the theft of an umbrella. Mild-mannered Dr. John Hamilton was known for being a romantic, and for being devoted to his wife Susan. On their wedding day, he surprised her with a Porsche, and throughout their 14-year marriage, he lavished her with expensive gifts and luxury holidays. The Hamiltons appeared to be deeply in love. The couple met in 1985, both were divorced and had four children between them. Susan was very attractive, intelligent and people loved being around her, John would fall head over heels in love with her. John was a well-respected obstetrician gynecologist in Oklahoma City, so as well as delivering babies, he also performed abortions, which attracted criticism in the conservative state. John's face was put on wanted posters by anti-abortion activists, and Susan received threatening phone calls. On Valentine's Day 2001, Dr. Hamilton left his office to exchange Valentine's cards with his wife, before he had to return later in the day to perform a surgery. When John returned home, he was to make a gruesome discovery, he found his wife in the bathroom in a pool of her own blood. She was dead. He dialed 911 and told the operator to send police and an ambulance, also telling them he was performing CPR. Police observed that Susan had been strangled to death with two of her husband's ties, and she was repeatedly bludgeoned over the head by a blunt instrument, which was never found during the investigation. The injuries to her head were so severe, that parts of her brain was exposed, and her face was unrecognizable. John was covered in Susan's blood, and was hysterical as he stared down at his wife's unrecognizable face. Who would kill her with such brutality? She had received threats from anti-abortion activists, maybe they had done this to punish John. The police didn't think so. There was no forced entry to the home, nothing was stolen and despite the amount of blood spilled, there were no bloody prints at the scene. John became the police's number one suspect. Detectives investigating the death, found a Valentine's card to John from his wife which read. I bought this two weeks ago, so I guess maybe it doesn't seem as appropriate, but I do love you, have a good day. Love Susan. Maybe the marriage wasn't as perfect as people thought. It also emerged that John had been making dozens of phone calls to an exotic topless dancer. Although John insisted she was a patient that he was trying to help. She accused John of having an affair. John was brought in for questioning, and on the car ride to the police station, officers noticed John scraping his knuckles off the mesh divider in the police car. Maybe he was trying to cover up injuries on his hand. John denied any involvement, but police didn't believe him and charged him with her murder. He was denied bail. The trial began in December 2001, and John had plenty of supporters, the community refused to believe that Dr. Hamilton was capable of such a heinous crime. It all came down to the blood evidence. Dr. Hamilton was covered in his wife's blood when paramedics arrived, he claimed he'd performed CPR on her, but there was a lack of blood on his mouth and face. 
it would be impossible not to have blood on his face, due to the severity of his wife's injuries. There was also blood on his shoe, consistent with splatter from an alive Susan. Police also found blood on his car steering wheel, to which John explained that he moved his car after he found Susan, to allow the ambulance onto the drive. The defense team brought out a blood expert, Tom Bevel, who testified that the blood patterns on John were consistent with him trying to save his wife. But when the blood expert was asked under oath, if there was anything that had been missed in the investigation, he alerted the court to a splatter inside John's cuff. He said it was likely to have been the result of John, forcing a blow to Susan's head with a blunt instrument. There was silence in the courtroom, the defense team couldn't believe what he just said. The blood expert, hired by the defense, had unwittingly become the prosecution's star witness. Tom Bevel would later say, Ultimately, you take the oath to tell the truth, and that overrides any allegiance I may have to my client. With Bevel's testimony, it took the jury only two hours to find the doctor guilty of his wife's murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the chance of parole. John continues to appeal the conviction, but has so far been denied a retrial. I bet that he hires a new defense lawyer. The effort this man puts into breaking through the window, only makes him appear more foolish once he realizes that the other side is open to the elements. It goes to show how stupid criminals can really be. He walks away, feeling lower than the scumbag he already is. On January 7, 1999, a tugboat operator near Krakow in Poland, stopped his boat to remove what he thought was a tree branch, or a tire that was stuck in his propeller. But when he inspected the blockage, he found a foul-smelling pale-colored object, and upon closer inspection, he noticed a human ear. It turned out that he had found the body of missing university student, Cartazina Zawada. Well it wasn't really the body of Cartazina, she had been skinned and that's what was found, a skin suit. The skin was neatly cut away at the thighs and neck, reaching only as far as the left ear, without the face and arms. Her nipples were also missing, and there was an oblique seam going from under the right breast to the left shoulder. The skin had been in the water for around three weeks before she was found, pieces of her sweater were also found floating at the scene. One week later, one of her legs were found at the hydroelectric dam nearby, floating amongst litter and tree branches. Experts believe Cartazina died of blood loss, and the killer ripped out her organs whilst she was still alive. In May, 1999, the Forensic Medicine Unit in Krakow, received a corpse of a man with a severed and scalped head. The killer turned out to be the son of the victim, named Vladimir. Prior to the arrest, he was seen wearing a mask, made of skin pulled from the head of his own father. Vladimir would put the mask on, and wear it to talk to his short-sighted grandfather. Initially, investigators suspected that Vladimir had committed Kartazina's murder, however, no evidence was found to support it. He was later charged with his father's murder, and sentenced to 25 years in prison. One year later, the case was formally dropped. But some of the officers who worked on the case, continued to follow leads and would still investigate her death. The case went cold, and it wasn't until 2017, 19 years after the murder, that police would make an arrest. Robert Janczewski, aged 52, was arrested in his apartment in Krakow. Police arrested Janczewski, after receiving a letter from a friend of his, the contents of the letter are a closely guarded secret of the investigation. He was a suspect in the 1999 investigation, but for some reason he wasn't arrested. Neighbors described Janczewski as a weirdo, who spied on women. He worked for Krakow Zoo, but was fired after all of the rabbits were killed on his shift, and he couldn't give an explanation why. Robert Janczewski is currently being held in custody without bail, 
It is unsure if the authorities have enough evidence to convict him, and due to the graphic nature of the crime, prosecutors have requested a closed trial. These next two clips have a few things in common, they are both terrible robbers, and both doors need to be pulled to open them. He hands the bank teller a note, before the security screens go up, he then panics, thinking he's locked in the bank and starts trying to break out. Just pull the door for God's sake. He eventually smashes through the door, and runs off up the street, police never identified him and he is still a wanted man. This next one is just as dumb, again after he gets scared by the security screens and tries to make off. But again the door becomes the obstacle from hell, and he just finds himself smashing against it. He seems to have given up and calmly walks back and to wait for the inevitable police to arrive. He gets a lucky break when some little old lady shows him how to work a door properly, and like the other, he flees on foot. Again this man was never caught, despite the good quality CCTV of him bashing his head against the door. If you'd like to see more videos of dumb criminals, and true crime stories, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you in the next video.